My name is Brett Labello. I'm the Director of Regional History and Genealogy here at Pikes Peak Library District. This is a really cool day for me because the last time we were all in this room was in 2019. So we've had a couple off years, or different years, not off, just different. Um, but it's nice to see all, all of the familiar faces as well as a bunch of new faces at the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium. On that note, I'd like to introduce uh, Teona Shabnitsa Krebs, who is our interim CEO and chief librarian for a couple remarks. So, Teona. Good morning, everyone. And I'm very impressed, Brett, you did pronounce my last name correctly. So, but yeah, thank you so very much for uh, being here today, this morning. And like Brett mentioned, that it is so, such a pleasure and privilege for us to see all of you in person. So uh, when people ask me, when did you have this event in person last time? It's hard for me to remember. It seems like it was centuries ago. But thank you again. Thank you for being here. And of course, all of you know that today's theme is um, resilience, resistance, and restoration. So, and Pikes Peak Library District is a nationally recognized system of public libraries that's serving 16 libraries in El Paso County. By the way, Brett and I had this disagreement. He thought we had 15 facilities, but as a good librarian, I made sure that we have um, 16 libraries. We have uh, bookmobile library services. Also, we have online resources, as you may know. And online resources, e-materials, did help us during our very challenging times because we, as the library, we always want to be there for our community members. And that was our way to serve our community even when there was no other way to have any meetings or programs in person. So we are very proud proud of that. And all our staff, our librarians, our frontline staff, they managed to change everything. I don't know how we did it. Within a week, we had resources available and programs av available online within a week. And why am I sharing this story with you? Because that speaks about us as a district that we are resilient. That what we did, we, very first time, I remember when eventually we were allowed to go to the Penrose Library building. I was there with some librarians. They needed to check out books. And guess what they did? The very first time, it was the day when they recorded a first story time. First story time for our families to have access online. So that's the resilience that we showed there. And we changed, and we were there for our community. So thank you very much for being here. One very important part to me as an individual, history means a lot. History means a lot to me because we, when I was growing up, I was growing up, actually I grew up in a Soviet Georgia, and my family, my grandparents, they were historians. Every summer, I would spend with my grandmother, who was a historian, and we had long conversations about history. And once she told me, Please make sure, it does not matter where you are, when you're an older, and you know, when you're an adult, when you have kids, make sure the history of your family is passed down on future generations. Talk about your ancestors. Talk about the fact that what mistakes we made as individuals that your children, their grandchildren won't, ma won't make those mistakes. And also part of our history as the country that they should be proud of it as well. I didn't know if my grandmother in some ways knew that I would not be living in Georgia. So that's kind of, that was her advice as a historian. We always talk not only about the history of uh, the Georgia, but also United States. We had this international map and she would show me different parts parts of the United States and would talk to me about history of this country as well. The other part, why it is so important to us as the library district to preserve authentic images, stories for our future generation is that, as you know, what's happening right now in Ukraine, that's devastating. That's devastating and what I experienced, this history that was taught in a Soviet countries was distorted lightly or distorted completely. And we see the results of it. And when in 2008, my own country of origin was attacked by Russia, it was forgotten. It was forgotten and we did not talk about it. 
And we did not realize that it would have such long-term consequences. So I'm so humbled to be part of this such an amazing district that we do our best to reserve this history for our future generations because we know history builds communities, history builds countries. And thank you again for being here today. And the love for history that I share is Brett Labello. When Brett started with us at Pikes Peak Library District, he and I, ha he and I had some very uh, interesting conversations about history. Because that time he did not have his own office, so he had to share office with me. I was the director of adult education. And I am so glad that Brett is here today to be to MC this event and to be part of Pikes Peak Library District. Again, thank you very much. Thank you for contributing to history of our region and helping us, empowering us to preserve it for our future generations. Thank you. And before we introduce our speakers, uh, for an event like this, there's a ton of thank yous that always need to go out. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Colorado Humanities, Helen and James McCaffrey Fund for Regional History, uh, the Friends of the Pike Peak, Pikes Peak Library District, and the Pikes Peak Library District Foundation. Uh, we also have many partners in this endeavor. Uh, those partners include the McAllister House, uh, UCCS Department of History, Pikes Peak Community College, Pikes Peak Genealogical Society, the Western Museum of Mining and Industry, and finally the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Um, and no thank you would be uh, complete without thanking the people and the staff that went uh, and participated and made this work. Uh, that's the East Library staff, uh, staff from communications, our district-wide communications team, and the entire regional history team. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of them here today, Tim Morris, who was doing the check-ins, check uh, Aaron Barnes, who will be helping and assisting during the coffee break, and Kara Ramsey, uh, who will be sort of unseen on the other side over there for the tech side of things. Uh, the one person that I would like to make a thank you, and I know she's not here, is Chris Nickel. Chris Nickel retired, exactly. Chris Nickel retired last year, but she had been the driving force of the, of the symposium for the first 15, 20 years. Uh, she has humbly and ably passed the baton on to Kara Ramsey, um, who is doing it right now. Um, so I would like to thank both, both Chris and Kara for that. Um, and at this point, I know that you guys love thank yous and everything like that, but you're really here to listen to somebody that's not me. Um, so I'll introduce our first speaker of the evening, or of the af afternoon, evening, morning, I don't know. Yeah, right? Um, our first speaker today is Barry Binder. Barry is a lecturer at the Department of uh, History at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. His most recent Research projects center on the transmission and evolution of ideas and identity through migration. These projects include a study of Scottish architects in Colorado Springs at the turn of the 20th century, an analysis of Chinese migrants in Colorado's press in the late 19th century, and historical examination of Mexican migrant laborers through their oral histories. Barry is also an active contributor to public history, having presented his research locally, contributed to the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum's COS at 150 exhibit and served as a commissioner on the Historic Preservation Board of Colorado Springs. Barry is a past presenter at the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium and his presentation today is titled Heathen Chinese, China Jim, Dr. Chun Sing and Chinese Question in the, in the Colorado's Press of 1869 through 1915. That's a mouthful. It is, I should have practiced, right? I like big titles. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, everybody. My name is Barry Binder. Um, I want to first thank you all for attending this morning um, and also for the folks at PPLD um, for setting this event up. And it's uh, my great pleasure to present uh, my research, which is entitled Heathen Chinese, Dr. Or China Jim, Dr. Chung Sing, and the, and the Chinese Question in Colorado's Press, 1869 to 1915. So as I get started here, I think it's important to set the stage about what this whole Chinese question is, for those of you that aren't familiar. So the Chinese question is really a catch-all phrase for this debate that occurred between, say, 1850 and the early 1900s about the presence of Chinese migrants in the United States, most specifically in the Western United States, and the presence of Chinese laborers here. Um, 
the first wave of Chinese migrant, migrants started coming to the U.S. basically with three main, three main occurrences, California Gold Rush, the passage of the Burlingham Seaward Treaty, which, uh, which allowed the free migration of peoples between China and the United States, and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. All these things resulted in the increased presence of Chinese migrants in the United States, and especially in the American West. And what this Chinese question was, was really more than just a question about Chinese migrants. It really was a debate between the Democratic and Republican Party about the topics of labor, politics, class, and race. And so you had the Democratic Party, who at the time largely represented the, uh, the free labor or working class who were very staunchly anti-Chinese migration, uh, debating with the Republican Party, who at the time largely um, represented the bourgeoisie class or the capital class, who were in favor of Chinese migration and, and the cheap labor that they provided to build the industry here. So this debate was played out in the American press. And I like to say that if we think the press is partisan today, it holds no candle to the partisan press during this period of time. They were staunchly, staunchly, um, unabashedly partisan in their reporting. So you had Republican newspapers and Democratic newspapers, and these were the vehicles by which the parties would um, communicate and reinforce the political and class-based sentiment of their platforms. So this Chinese question was very, very relevant during this period, and it played out in the American press. And that's the focus uh, of my study here. So during this period of time, I'm not going to go through all this, there was a lot of acts of anti-Chinese anti violence, as well as the passage of migration legislation against Chinese migrants in the United States, uh, following the passage of the Burlingham Seaward Treaty. And this, uh, this resulted, and many of you have seen these, both national and local depiction of Chinese migrants where they really were demonized. These pictures of them uh, in very racist, orientalist, orientalist and, um, and stereotypical depictions of them could be seen throughout the press. So how did Colorado fit into the context of this overall picture? Colorado was very unique during this period of time. Um, being granted statehood in 1876, I like to refer to it as the easternmost of the western states during this period. Uh, really where the anti-Chinese sentiment was growing was on the western coast in California and in Oregon. Um, and actually in Colorado, in the 1870s, uh, both the governor of Colorado, uh, Edward Moody McCook, and the Colorado House uh, they openly encouraged the migration of Chinese into uh, Colorado at this period of time. Largely dominated by Republican politics, Colorado was less, was more inviting of Chinese migrants, if you would, and they also saw Chinese migrants as being able to boast the population and the industries in Colorado, hopefully leading to statehood, which it of course did. So very unique position for Colorado during this, during this period. However, that doesn't mean that there weren't people here who were afraid of Chinese migration and, and were not happy about it. So here is an article from the Daily Central City from 1869 which warns its readers about an invading Mongolian heathen horde taking over Colorado, right? So certainly fearful, um, if not just racist, you know. So we know, however, that uh, an invading heathen horde never really came to Colorado. Based on census records in 1870, out of the 40,000 people living in the Colorado Territory, there were seven Chinese migrants here. <laughs> 30 years later in 1900, of the 540,000 people living in Colorado, there were 566 Chinese migrants here. So certainly not an invading heathen horde, right? But this Chinese question still played out in the press, and you can see articles about Chinese migrants and the Chinese question in Colorado's press. Uh, because again, it represented something more than just the presence of Chinese migrants. It was about politics and class and race. So the newspapers had to communicate to their readers, to their constituents, how to view this issue of Chinese migration. So here's an example from Colorado's partisan press. And so this was no, no more represented strongly in Colorado than after the uh, October 1880 anti-Chinese riot in Denver which resulted in the, in the murder of at least one Chinese, the beatings of dozens, and the complete decimation of the Chinatown in Denver, which was never rebuilt. So here's how the press represented that, uh, that event. Uh, the Daily Chieftain from Pueblo, which is a Republican publication, stated, quote, the inflammatory speeches of Saturday night and the inflammatory whiskey drank Saturday night and all day Sunday worked the Democratic hoodlums into the proper frame of mind to be ready for anything, even riot and murder, right? Representation by the Republican press. Representation by the Democratic press, the Georgetown Herald, states, quote, what is the use of having them here if we cannot have a little fun once in a while by killing a few of them without having to pay the fiddler? That is the representation of the partisan press in Colorado about Chinese migrants. Vastly different opinions, right? 
So here comes in, and I will segue to the stories of China Jim and Dr. Chung Sing uh, in, the, in the Pikes Peak region. I know many of you might take, uh, I could debate whether or not Pueblo, Colorado is a Pikes Peak region. Let's just be liberal with the definition <laughs> of the Pikes Peak region here. So I'm primarily a migration historian, and one of the things I endeavor to do is to locate and provide individual migrant narratives whenever I do migration history. Um, Chinese migrants during this period, it's very hard to find individual narratives because they didn't leave much behind. So I was very, very fortunate, sorry, very fortunate to find these two individual uh, narratives, the narrative of China Jim and uh, Dr. Chung Singh. And what I like to do is contextualize the way that they were represented in the press in the Pikes Peak region with this bigger question, this bigger picture of the Chinese question. So this is a picture of China Jim. You can see very obviously that he had adopted Western wear, Western attire. His name was something akin to Liu Bo Fu, but he was known in uh, the press as China Jim. The census record here actually shows him named as Jim China. That's in, in the census. He was born in Canton, China in 1865. He immigrated to the United States in 1882. And sometime in the late 1800s, he ended up in Meeker, Colorado, which is in the northwest corner of Colorado. And there he served as a cook. And at some point, he received a shipment of these what are called fancy Asian goods, Japanese and Chinese goods. And he set up shop in the Meeker Hotel and started selling these what were becoming very fashionable Asian goods, assumingly to wealthy white consumers in Meeker, Colorado. Two years later, he apparently was successful enough to come 300 miles to Colorado and set up the second China and Jim store. Uh, it was said he came here to, to drive a stagecoach. I would argue that he likely came here to sell his Asian goods to this growing bourgeoisie population in Colorado Springs during the period. Um, so from this time, for 25 years, the story of China Jim plays out in the columns of the Colorado Springs Gazette. What's most noted about him is his business success and his uh, status as a very prominent member of the Chinese migrant community in the United States. So we know his success with these two stores led to him opening a newspaper in San Francisco and opening several properties in San Francisco as well. And we know also that uh, very prominent members of the Chinese community would come here, benevolent societies, to, conf to confer with him on things like educational and relief campaigns. Um, they also, the Colorado Springs Gazette also reported greatly on his continued connection to China. So during this period, there was legislation passed that, that um, would not allow a Chinese migrant here to return to China and then come back. China Jim was one of the few migrants that could actually do this because he paid taxes and he owned property in the United States. So he would go back and forth between Colorado and China all the time, many, many trips. So we know he established a family there, and he later brought them back here with him to Colorado Springs. We know he established a bank and some stores in Canton, China, and he would provide donations to uh, organizations in China, uh, including the Canton Christian College. His most significant connection to China remained probably his relationship with Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who became the first uh, president of the Republic of China after the abdication of the last Chinese emperor. Um, China Jim and Dr. Sun Yat-sen were associates. And so this article from the February 1912 Colorado Springs Gazette talks about this, and it's entitled, Hooray for China Jim. And the article states, Jim has lived in our midst for 20 years or more, and everybody knows and enjoys him, but few of us ever suspected that he was a statesman and an empire builder, or rather a republic builder and an empire destroyer. But he is just the same. Jim is the right bower of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the new president of China, and next Sunday he is going to leave this town for his native land to give 400, mil 400 million fellow celestials the benefit of his knowledge on how to run a republic. And he did in fact go to China, he stayed there for a year and a half, and he consulted with Dr. Sun Yat-sen. So pretty amazing accomplishment for an assumingly penniless teenager who came to the United States about 20 years earlier, right? Uh, the papers also report on his family life. Probably the most notable was the birth of his son, uh, Charles Lee, Leo James Bafunda, in uh, 1905. And he was noted as the first Chinese child born in the shadows of Pikes Peak. And this was published all throughout Colorado. An interesting thing, many of these publications said that the little boy was direct lineal descendant of Confucius himself. <laughs> Pretty amazing stuff, huh? Uh, the, the, the boys were also Christian in the Episcopal Church here, so China Jim had converted to Christianity as well at this time. Uh, China Jim died here in Colorado Springs in 1915, and at the time his estate was valued at about $10,000. In today's dollars and cents, that's about a quarter of a million dollars. So a pretty sizable estate, and that doesn't include any of the properties or businesses he had in San Francisco or China. Um, so his body was prepared and be sent back to China to be interned there, to be buried there. The steamship that he, his body was on capsized off of Hong Kong. His body was never recovered and was never returned to his family. So that's the story of China Jim. 
Let me contrast that uh, with Dr. Chung Singh, as told in the Republican paper, The Pueblo Daily Chieftain. Much shorter reporting time, 1885 to 1886. I believe this is the first time I've presented this information about this individual. I've talked to people in Pueblo, they have no idea about this story. So I'm, I'm very, very excited to, to tell this story. Uh, this is the only depiction I can find of Dr. Chung Singh. Obviously looks very different than China Jim. Traditional Chinese clothing, traditional Chinese hair. Um, his, his origins are a bit more murky as well. The census shows that he was born in China in 1849, but we don't know when he came here. And the census records show that he was a laundryman. But we really know that Dr. Chung Sing was a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. He was what would be known as a Dai Fu, or a, a, a Chinese physician. So studies that have been done about Chinese physicians in the United States during this period are, are very limited. But what they all say is that these physicians were underground, and they largely treated just the small migrant communities which, were, that, which they lived within. This was totally different in Pueblo, because we know through the press that Dr. Chung Sing served hundreds and hundreds of white patients who would come from throughout the region to seek his miraculous cures. Um, this, of course, caught the attention of the authorities, and that began what I like to call the persecution of Dr. Chung Sing. So on February 9th of 1885, he was arrested, tried, convicted, and fined of, quote, practicing medicine contrary to the law that is without a diploma or license. And at this point, what plays out in this Republican newspaper in Pueblo is very contrasting uh, opinions about Dr. Chung Singh. Some applaud him, and some demonize him for his practices. So you start to see these very conflicting uh, opinions about him being a miraculous healer or a quack, basically. But he continued to practice traditional Chinese medicine in Pueblo, and a week later he was arrested for a second time. This time he, uh, he contests the charges. There's this huge trial. It's talked about in the press all over Colorado. He has dozens and dozens of his white patients that come and testify on his behalf of these miraculous cure, and he's ultimately acquitted on all charges. Continues to practice traditional Chinese medicine. A month later, he's arrested for the third time, tried, convicted, and fined, and this time the, the charges stick. Right? But he keeps practicing traditional Chinese medicine. A few months later, a civil suit is brought against him. It's quickly dismissed as some sort of blackmailing scheme, and he's acquitted on the charges. And there's an article in the paper which states, quote, the little Chinaman can't be downed. He is here to stay. He is now looking for a suitable place to build him a hospital that he may take care of his own sick. We one and all should give him a warm welcome. And so what you see in the paper after this is all of these conflicting opinions about him. So these are some of them. I like this one. Uh, this is the one that kind of uh, decries him. Quote, it is said by some of Dr. Chung Sing's female patients that the doctor speaks entirely too plainly about the human organism in parts. Why in the name of decency don't respectable women keep away from him if he is such a blackguard as it is said as he is, right? Two days later, this comes out, this one on the bottom. Um, Dr. Chung Sing recommends his patients to buy their clothing at the Commonwealth Clothing House. He become a celebrity. Merchants were using his name to advertise their goods. So you get these very conflicting opinions about him in the press. They take interest in him and the press starts reporting on his personal life as well. His marriage, his trips to Colorado Springs, these lavish fireworks displays he had put on during the, the Chinese New Year, things like this. Ultimately, in 1886, Dr. Chung Sing and his wife relocate to Kansas City. There's no definitive reason for it. I would, I would argue that's probably because he knew he was just going to keep being persecuted in, in Pueblo by the law. Um, but he moved to Kansas City, reestablished his practice there, and within two years purchased a property there for his practice that, at value to $18,000. In today's dollars and cents, that's more than a half a million dollars. So here's a guy who obviously was very, very successful and attained a great amount of wealth, uh, not only at, with, um, with white patients, but continuing to practice traditional Chinese medicine uh, in Colorado and in Kansas City. So what I like to do here in conclusion is to contextualize these two individual narratives, very different narratives, into the larger scheme of this idea, this national idea of the Chinese question, and how the press represented Chinese migrants and how they were able to reinforce or communicate their political and class-based sentiment to their readers. So at China Jim, uh, what we see is an individual Chinese migrant who was able to achieve extreme success through assimilation, right? He took on Western wear, he was, Christ he was converted, his children were Christianed in the church, he had a pretty wife, he lived with what the press called a typical American life. 
Um, and so he, the, the press was able to present him as the ideal Chinese migrant, someone that shouldn't be feared, someone who if they adopted Western wear and adopted Western ways of thinking, they could be here right in our midst there. There was nothing wrong with them being here. And what they were also able to do was to contradict this long-held democratic assertion that Chinese were either unwilling or unable to assimilate, right? So the press presented this rags-to-riches tale of China Jim, which really reads like a Hollywood movie script, right? So that's the way they were able to present him. You'll never find anything bad said about China Jim, or at least I have not found anything bad. Conversely, you have Dr. Chung Sing. And this is a Chinese migrant who lived in an overwhelmingly white community who found success without assimilation. In fact, he stood up to the authorities and continued to press and press his desire to practice traditional Chinese medicine. Well, the press was unable to define this, right? We see these contradicting articles. Some applaud him and some demonize him because they just didn't know what to make of this guy. Here he was continuing to look traditionally Chinese in his appearance and to practice traditional Chinese medicine, which was a linchpin of the culture. Um, so this really, which I think is very important, uh, in, a, in the macro sense, it, contradict, it contradicts this continuing notion that Chinese migrants at this period were simply voiceless victims. That's the way Chinese migrants during this period are portrayed. In the historiography today, they continue to be portrayed by, like this. So if here's one example of an individual Chinese migrant in Pueblo, Colorado, who was successful despite all of the barriers that were put in front of him and, and the... And the, and the, um, the, the the choices that the authorities made to try to prevent him from practicing medicine, he clearly stood up to those authorities. He can't be the only Chinese migrant that did this, right? So this idea of them being simply voiceless victims, I think, is a fallacy. And this is a good story that, that uh, shows that. So that is the end of my discussion. I'll leave this quote up here for you to uh, read. I think it's, it's relevant. Uh, this is by Mary Roberts Coolidge from her work, Chinese Immigration, in 1909. This is, of course, after Chinese migrants have been prevented from coming here, and it speaks to the way the opinion of Chinese migrants started to change during this period, and certainly did to the middle of the 20th century. With that, I thank you all, and I look forward to any questions you might have uh, after everybody presents. Thank you, Barry. Okay, to keep this train running, I will introduce our next speaker. Julia Haberluck is a French teacher and geologist with an interest in local history. Julia has worked for 13 years as an educator and translator at Academy International Elementary School, the French Immersion School in D20. Julie's prior work includes serving as a geologist and tour guide at the Western Museum of Mining and Industry for almost 10 years. She's been leading field trips, presenting rock talks, and acting as the local mountain man for elementary students for many years. Julie has a BA in geology from Williams College and a MS in geology from University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Julie is a first-time presenter uh, at the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium. Her presentation is titled Silver Fox Farming in El Paso County, 1920 to 1950, The Rise and Fall of an Industry. Take it away, Julie. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so I'm here to present my research on silver fox farming in El Paso County from 1920 to 1950. And I wanted to answer when and where did fox farming develop, why did it come to El Paso County, and what happened to make it disappear so completely that we only have a name of Fox Run Regional Park left as a trace. Um, and what is fox farming? So we're all on the same page. Fox farming is the raising and selective breeding of foxes in captivity to be killed and made into fashion garments. Um, and where did it de develop? Um, it developed in Canada where mutant silver and black foxes were occasionally brought into Hudson Bay throughout the years, and the pelts would bring from $1,000 to $1,800 a pelt at a time when beaver pelts, which was the currency in the fur trade, um, were bringing $2 in trade goods and about $5 per pound um, at the auction market. Um, so this is a picture of a, whoopsie, of a red fox, um, and that's the most common variety in North America. Um, and these underneath is the um, mutant, this is a dark silver fox, a half silver fox, um, which would be brought in occasionally. They're a, national, a natural mutant. Um, and occasionally the trappers would pen the animals and raise them to prime fur season because that's only from about November to December. Um, and they would try to get them to reproduce in captivity, but it proved really difficult. 
So in 1887, Charles Dalton, who's now known as the father of the silver fox industry, started experimenting with selective breeding of mutant black foxes on Prince Edward Island, which is in the Gulf of St. Lawrence um, in eastern Canada. Um, in 1896, he joined forces with an Robert Olton, who was also breeding the foxes. He was doing more of the open pen breeding. Um, and so they joined forces and were breeding Alaskan silver foxes, um, again on Prince Edward Island. And by 1900, they had finally um, succeeded in developing a breeding line that could produce reliably high quality silver foxes. Um, and so what were they breeding for? They were breeding for color, for size, for deeper, more luxurious fur, better leather, calmer animals, and eventually over the years for polygamy. Um, and this is what they were breeding for. They wanted, this is what they arrived at. This is a beautiful specimen of a full silver. Um, and it's the guard hairs that, that give them that silver sheen and that's what was so um, sought after in the fur trade. And so the price of silver fox pelts prior to 1900, um, like I said, it was about 1,000 to $1,800 a pelt that they could get for these occasional bl um, wild black and silver mutant foxes that would come in. Um, in 1900, Dalton and Olton were successful, and they sold a farm-raised silver black fox pelt for $1,800 on, um, on the London market. In 1910, they sold f um, 50 pelts for $35,000. That's about $700 a pelt at a time when the farming of an average salary um, at that time was $450. So you can see that this is incredible wealth. Um, um, so while the silver, but this is the, the catch, um, they were trying to keep a monopoly on this. So there were about six farmers and ranchers that were breeding these silver fox pelts on Prince Edward Island, and they had done, made a verbal compact that they wouldn't sell any breeding pairs. But in 1911, um, one of the cousins sold a breeding, two breeding pairs outside of that compact, and so the monopoly was broken. And then everybody could purchase breeding pairs of foxes. and um, so what happened is that uh, whereas a pelt could bring five hundred to two thousand dollars a pelt, um, a live breeding pair of foxes could bring ten thousand to thirty-five thousand dollars. So economically driven, um, it, it took off, and so it was mostly um, that silver fox industry was mostly based in the Upper Midwest and New York and in Canada. But then um, World War One ended. Um, Spanish flu epidemic ended. There was a return to purchasing luxury goods. Farm fashions had evolved, or did evolve rapidly with the Roaring Twenties, and they had perfected the technique for raising and reproducing foxes in captivity. And they were widely selling those breeding pairs, creating a much bigger supply. Um, and then all the farmers wanted in on this bonanza, um, because with a single quality fur pelt, you could pay um, for all of your costs. I mean, it was incredible um, return on your investment. Um, so the first fox farm arrives in El Paso County right away. In 1921, W.H. Um, Moyle, a fox farmer from Wisconsin, so he was an established fox farmer, comes looking for another place to raise foxes and chooses Fountain, Colorado, and brings two breeding pairs um, worth $6,000 to $8,000. Um, and that's pretty much when the fox farming um, arrived in Colorado in general. There are a few farms. One farm was established um, in, um, on Lookout Mountain in, Colorado, in uh, Denver, um, but otherwise we were among the first. Um, and why do they come to El Paso County? Because of the cold, dry climate and tall shade trees. That, the tall shade trees are important because the shade is good for the fur quality. Um, sandy, well-drained soils, um, which is improving, which is um, keeping down diseases, um, good transportation, rail transportation, both to bring feed and supplies in, but also to export those pelts to the eastern and foreign markets. A good cheap agricultural labor pool, agriculturally trained labor pool that was um, available for seasonal work because that was, there was the high season for the fox industry is October to December, whereas in the agri there's sort of a lull for the agricultural industry and they can hire those agricultural workers who are used to um, working with animals because they're having to haul in. Each fox eats about a pound of meat a day and they have to bring in um, horses and cows and um, they were fed rabbits often too. Um, but anyway, a lot of um, horses to, to bring in slaughter to feed these animals. Um, and 
what, oh, did I change this? Um, they also have, there's a wealthy population in Colorado Springs, also a tr strong tourist industry, um, and it's much more profitable than ranching, which can be a hard here with um, the weather and the um, grasshoppers and whatever plagues they were encountering. Um, but it could also supplement, so it didn't have to replace um, ranching, it could supplement. And that's important because later on there's a difference between what happens, sort of the fate of um, some of these ranchers. So here's a map of the um, box farms that I've identified in El Paso County. And actually, um, the one in Fountain is not shown on here, um, just because of the scale. Um, and the big significant thing is this Black Forest fur farm, which in the 30s and 40s was the biggest fur f um, silver fox farm in Colorado, um, and, in all of Colorado. And in the 40s, there's an, um, I have an article that's, it was the biggest one west of the Mississippi. So we are significant in being the biggest um, or having the biggest fox farm. Um, this, just to give you a sense of, of place, this is Palmer Lake, and this is County Line Road up here. And then these um, are all along uh, Roller Coaster Road, and this is Black, this is the um, Fox Run Regional, well, part of which became Fox Run Regional Park. Um, so if you know where that is. And that's the last trace of, um, just through that name, um, and Black Forest Fur Farm had 900 pens, and each pen is holding a fox family, um, and there's about three to four kits produced um, yearly. Um, they were um, producing between 3,200 and 4,000 pelts per year, um, and so it's pretty incredible that the whole industry has disappeared. Um, and then there's a whole bunch, here is, um, this is Black Forest Center, this is Black Forest um, Road and Shoop Road intersection. Um, so you, just to give you some location. And this is the Air Force Academy. So those, I actually know those are ranches, but I have um, Jack Anthony, who works with the Palmer Lake Historical Society, had actually seen the old fox pens before that area was made into the athletic fields. Um, and this is significant, well here, um, the Spalding Farm had 95 pens, um, and that is important. Um, Judy Kilgore and Bob Kilgore are back here, and their material from um, his father was very key in just how, that's really all the information that's left at the Pioneer Museum. They left the, what's called the Kilgore Collection with a lot of papers and information specific. Um, and Jude and his, um, Bob Kilgore's wife, Hermina Kilgore, wrote a book, um, Rough uh, Road in the Rockies, which um, was like, if you've ever read Tomboy Bride, it's like, it's daily life in, of having a fox farm in the 30s. Um, so it's really gives you some personal information. Um, and then here is Happy Landing Ranch, which um, that's where the, I've got pelts back here that you'll be able to feel and see examples of these fox pelts. I ask that you touch them with the back of your hand if you um, handle them. But um, they were from Happy Landing Ranch, um, and those. And he, he was um, he bought his ranch actually almost when the um, farming fox farming collapsed. But he was able to pay it off the ranch in one year from the profits of of raising foxes. This is in 1945, which is significant. And Bob Kilgore had actually leased the ranch up here, the Spalding Ranch, and. He um, did it one year too late and went out of business as a result and had to pay off loans for like 20 years. Um, so that was a really horrible, uh, not, he was resilient because he changed jobs, but it was a resistance. Um, okay, and so this is a, a picture of Bill Brown and his son Gwillem, so um, Marlene's um, grandfather who fo farmed foxes. This is actually probably not his farm, but at the Gibbs Fox and Mink Ranch. Um, and, but you have a typical um, fox pen behind him um, with the chicken wire all around and on the top and also underneath because otherwise the fox is a dig out. But you can see that the um, ponderosa are in the, in the pens and providing shelter and shade. Um, this is an example from, it's actually the KB farm in Morrison, Colorado. But that's where Bob Kilgore was raising, he was managing that ranch uh, before he came to El Paso County. But you can see um, this, the pens were generally about 20 by 40. They each house one fa um, fox family. 
And these kennels are underground, but there's the feeding platform, and that's um, just to prevent disease. There's also the double enclosure, so that when the foxes escape from here, they still are within an enclosure so they can be caught again, because they're worth a lot of money, these breeding pairs. Um, and here is um, Bill Brown with um, probably late 40s um, with all of the pelts, so he's uh, pelted out. Um, and here it's um, significant because these are, uh, as the fashions changed, the, um, they were breeding for lighter and lighter foxes. Um, and so these are the dark, well, these are still pretty light silver compared to what you were getting in the 20s and 30s. But these are platinum foxes. And also these, you can see they're white face foxes. Um, you can, and that, the Black Forest Fur Farm was famous world over. They were world famous for the quality of their white face foxes because each of these are mutations that, that they can carry through. Um, so here is what's driving the industry. It's that every woman who is going to go out anywhere um, it need, feels like she needs to have a fur coat. And it, the fox furs weren't used so much as full fur coats like the mink were. Um, they were used as trim. But from the wealthy, and um, this is actually a good example. They were, it was the style to wear the full fox pelt and a double fox pelt here. Um, this is on, and this is how you're supposed to wear it with the... Um, Fox on, t on your shoulder on the right and down on the left. Um, so um, very stylish. And you can see the style now is the thick f fur. Um, so it's very plush fur was the style in the 20s and 30s. Um, then, but every day, uh, if you were going to the grocery store or you're going to the library, you would also you wear your fur. Um, so here is a woman. Um, these are all wearing the fur trim. She's wearing a black um, fox, the whole pelt. And as is this woman who's on the eastern plain, and she's got a full black, felt, uh, black um, fox fur on. Um, and this is a lot of numbers, but it's mostly to show you the trends. Um, so 1923 is the first year that the U.S. kept um, records, um, and there were 9,000 pelts sold for an average price per pelt of $96. You can see that production increased steadily through the 20s, um, as did the prices. And with 2020 hindsight, we know that this is actually the top price that, um, that they got um, as a, an average for pelts because then the depression hit and the price um, dropped. But the production continued to climb. Um, it was still a good business to be in, and it leveled out. Um, and the 1930s, um, it turns out 1938 is the height of the industry, and 150 mink, fox and mink ranches existed in Colorado alone, um, with thousands existing across the U.S. Um, and then, so the prices had stayed steady during the 30s, um, and then World War II hits. Um, and production drops dramatically because the farmers have to go to war, and they're also, all those products have to be sent for the war effort. Um, but the prices for the pelts actually stayed fairly steady at around $40 a pelt. Um, and the av but unfortunately, the average cost of raising the foxes was climbing, 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 climbing. And then the bottom drops out of the industry in 1946. And as Robert Kilgore said, in, we got the best price for, the, or we got $10 for the best pelt we had in 1947. And a few years before, it would have brought $100. Um, and that's when there was a huge, um, it was just the, the quality of the pelts at that time was much, much better than what they'd been raising in the 40s and, or the 20s and 30s because they'd had 50 years to develop these pedigreed lines um, and had developed beautiful, beautiful breeding um, lines and furs. Um, and the reasons for the demise was a bunch of things. Um, but it, part of it was that 20% excise war tax was still being charged by the U.S. by the government because they were trying to repay a $10 billion debt from World War II. Um, there was a lack of advertising, which the Fox industry had always complained about because it's advertising that drives fashion. Um, there was a production of low-quality furs because the small ranchers um, weren't as worried about the pedigree lines. They needed to pay off their loans. Um, they need to, to pay their costs, and that all happens in the fox industry at the end of the year. So you have to borrow the money up front and then pay it back at the end. Um, so 
they were selling, they were pelting out all of their foxes, even if they were low quality, as opposed to keeping those or maybe culling their herds. Um, there was also, um, an, it, the fashion was involving to, to uh, shorter furs and mink at that time, and there's nothing you, you can do about that taste, fashion. Um, and they had increased, the, they had perfected the raising of mink because mink are harder to raise. Foxes were the first fur-bearing animals that were, um, that were domesticated or were able to be raised. Mink um, were a lot more persnickety and would eat their young if there was like the blow, the, the train of a, a train whistle or something. So um, it was much harder. So until they were able to breed the calmer mink, um, they weren't able to raise them so easily. But also there was no foreign market for the furs and the, they were, the, after World War II, the foreign countries were dumping all of their furs which they'd stockpiled during World War um, II. Um, and the Russians um, were dumping theirs, and they'd only gotten breeding pairs in 1936. So um, all of a sudden they were, and they could control the price because they were, had state farms, so they could undersell our farmers. Um, so prior to World War II, there were 3,000 fox producers in the U.S. By 1950, there's only 450. Black Forest Fur Farm sold out in 1949. Hansen Farm had, um, had, uh, fire in 1949, they sold out. Spalding, um, Bill, um, Bob Kilgore sold his farm in 1949 as well. They all went bankrupt. Um, so the fate of the fox farm, a few fox farms like Happy Landing was able to, um, well, he because he didn't focus, he was not raising foxes as his primary source of income. He also had, a, a, he was ranching. Whereas Bob Kilgore was, had 95 pence, he was only um, doing the, ran, the far, fox farming. In 1980, Colorado banned the raising or even owning of foxes. So there goes the fox industry here. 1980 happens to be the year um, that People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals um, was founded. And first came back a little bit um, in the 1980s, but with the growing activism and influence of PETA, it became just in politically incorrect to wear furs. Um, and here is the last remaining fox kennel in El Paso County that I know of. And this is Marlene um, standing at Happy Landing Farm. And this is the state of the fox pens now, big piles of chicken wire. And that's more than the, exists anywhere else the, because the chicken wire's been hauled away. So there's actually no traces of fox farming in, in El Paso County or occasionally I, you know, I will hear uh, and see people will send me pictures of some that exist in, um, but it's mostly like this, and here's what the fox kennels look like. So this is the last one that we know of, um, and that's it. Thank you, and I would love to answer questions. <laughs>third and final speaker in this portion of the symposium is Millie Malika. And she's a student at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Millie is a double major in political science and history and upon graduating, plans on working for a grassroots organization and starting a political career. Millie was born and raised in Colorado Springs. Millie attended Stratton Elementary School, Eagle View Middle School, which will be important in a little bit, and Air Academy High School. While in college, she found a passion for research and Colorado history. Millie is a first-time presenter at the Pikes Peak Regional History Symposium, and her presentation is titled, Dominique Malika, A Remarkable Man and His Legacy. My name is Millie Malika, and I'm one of the seven grandchildren of Dominic and Tony Malika. I would like to start off with a show of hands. How many of you recognize my last name? <laughs> Thank you. I am here to share, today to share with you the remarkable legacy of my grandfather, Dominic Malika. Dominic Malika was raised in Trinidad, Colorado. He grew up going to school and teasing Antoinette, Tony for short, DeAngelis. Tony was always annoyed by Dominic's silly antics, but her view of him changed during their senior year of high school when they attended the senior dance together. After that, they became truly inseparable. After high school, Dominic went to Trinidad Junior College where he obtained his teaching degree 
and Tony attended nursing school in Denver. The two were engaged, but like many young men during the 1950s, he was drafted into the army and was deployed to Germany where he worked on missiles. After his tour, he returned to Colorado and he and Tony were married in 1957. That same year, Dominic was approached by Cokedale, Colorado, or excuse me, that same year, Dominic started his teaching career in Cokedale, Colorado. A year later, their first child, Gina, was born. And around that same time, the Starkville School District approached Dominic and offered him the job, or should I say jobs, a principal, fifth through eighth grade teacher, janitor, and coach at their small one-room schoolhouse. <laughs> Dominic accepted the job because it was a better commute from Trinidad, but I also think that the challenge excited him. He was so excited to make a difference in his students' lives that he and Tony spent that whole summer sanding the desks so that the students would have a smooth surface to write on. It is in this one-room schoolhouse that his legacy and his ability to reach children begin to take root. Dominic and Tony had really enjoyed their lives in Trinidad and had planned to raise their children there. But in 1961, the youngest at the time, Janet, was extremely sick and Dominic and Tony found themselves driving to Colorado Springs on a weekly basis for doctor's visits. The young parents realized they had a choice to make stay in Trinidad and continue to commute to Colorado Springs, or uproot their lives and move to the city permanently. When Dominic was offered the job of teaching fifth grade history at Douglas Valley Elementary, it seemed like a sign. So he accepted the job, packed up their lives in Trinidad, and set out for Colorado Springs. Dominic thrived at Douglas Valley even while he raised five children at home and worked nights at King Supers. Some might say that he spread himself thin, but this resilient and hardworking spirit came to define every aspect of his life. Not only could Dominic's principal at Douglas Elementary see his potential, but the district could too. In 1965, a principal position opened at Air Academy Junior High, and Dominic was immediately put on the short list. This new opportunity and its responsibilities is what Dominic had worked for and Tony always supported. And so, my grandfather, who began his teaching career at a one-room schoolhouse, was now the principal of a junior high. As a principal, Dominic had the honor of shaping the lives of hundreds of adolescents. He included his own children and his future daughter-in-law among his students. Dominic understood that children needed structure, but also tenderness. And as such, he was a firm but fair principal. One of the many lives that Dominic impacted during his time as a principal was Ivor Davis. And in an interview with me, he remembers a trip he took to Mr. Malika's office after an altercation with another student. There I was, just a young punk ready to take a verbal assault straight on. To my surprise, Mr. Malika afforded me a level of respect that I never would have expected from someone in his position. He listened. He never talked down to me. He spoke to me, man to man, each of us showing mutual respect to each other. We chatted for quite a while. From this, I gained some valuable life wisdom, some of which I continue to employ to this day. I learned that if you give respect, you're more likely to receive respect. It has helped me to obtain and succeed in leadership roles. I am better prepared to mentor people. Ivor is one of the many students whom Grandpa positively impacted during his time as principal. He understood that children needed consequences for their actions, but they also needed to feel respected. The lessons and, Dominic and values that Dominic instilled in his students have stuck with them long into adulthood and have been passed on to their children. Many of his students would become respected members of the community. I can say this confidently because on a whim one day while I was doing my research, I posted on the Air Academy Alumni High School page on Facebook and asked if anyone who knew my grandfather could share a valuable life lesson with me. In a matter of minutes, I had over 300 positive responses. <laughs> Grandpa's impact on students is only one of the numerous contributions. 
As the years went by and Colorado Springs began to expand in the mid-1980s, Academy District 20 decided that it was time to add a middle school. Now, adding a middle school would be no easy task, as it was a different concept from a junior high. The planning, defining, and execution would require someone creative, passionate, and resilient to take on the task. Again, Dominic Malika's name was immediately at the top. He was ecstatic at the idea of creating a middle school. So when he was offered the job of planning principal, he became involved in every aspect of creating the school. From sitting in with architects, to picking the colors, to naming the school Eagle View, and most importantly, defining what a middle school would mean in District 20. Dominic had learned from both his time at Air Academy Junior High and watching his own children go to school that a middle school should be a place where students and their parents felt at home. He wanted his teachers to not only be passionate about the subject area, but also about their students. As such, he created teaching teams, which meant that students would have the same four teachers for their core subjects every day, and that teams could have some flexibility in their scheduled activities. He also constructed the school so that each grade level had its own wing. After defining and designing the school, it came time to hire teachers. Dominic had a knack for hiring extraordinary teachers who were passionate about the children, a legacy that continues there today. Once the school had opened its doors in 1986, Dominic asked Ross McGaskill to be his vice principal. The two continued to work side by side for seven years at Eagle View. In an interview with Ross, he describes what it was like working closely with Dominic. Dominic Malika was one of the most important people in my life. His strengths were understanding, caring, and celebrating people. He was not necessarily a scholar, but understood that if he couldn't figure out how to motivate people, nothing else mattered. He had something intuitive that he could see in people when no one else could. He was able to look at someone and know that they were a good person. He also knew how critical it was to know that someone believed in you. Finally, when someone asked him to do something, he always tended to say yes. After Eagle View Middle School implemented the teaching teams, the rest of Air Academy District 20 Middles followed suit. Delyn Martineau, a former teacher at Eagle View Middle School, claims that the, teaching, the team teaching style is one of her favorites because it helps teachers have a relationship with their students. Once it was obvious that McGaskill, the teachers, and the administrators could not only stand on their own, but be successful without him, he decided that it was time to retire. And in 1993, he did. But Dominic was not the type of man to, re to retire quietly to a life of leisure. Opening a deli had been a longtime dream of Dominic, Tony, and their son, Jerry. And Tony's father had owned and operated his own grocery store in Delhi in Trinidad. And in 1987, marked the opening of Malika's Deli and Market on Garden of the Gods Road. It has continued to be a staple of our community for 35 years. All of the recipes came from family. Tony made the sauce, Jerry made the sausage, another son, John, built all the deli cases, and Dominic did all of the books by hand. My grandmother told me, we knew that the deli would be successful because we knew everyone in the area. <laughs> Just like with Eagle View, when creating the deli, Dominic's goal was to build a community within itself. Several employees have worked at the deli since it opened, and Jerry is currently the owner and operator of the deli. Four of Malika's own grandchildren have also worked there. With all of the growing chain restaurants on Garden of the Gods Road, Malika stands as a place where customers come to get quality food and feel like they're a part of our family. Grandpa would be proud. Think about what we, as a community, have overcome in the past two years with the COVID-19 pandemic. While many of the family and locally owned shops were not able to reopen their doors, the driving spirit that Dominic instilled in his family, the deli, and the community continued. And that's why I think we made it through. Dominic had always been energetic and worked hard for his family, students, and community. 
His energy continued well into his retirement until one day in September of 1997, he noticed that it was starting to fade and he began to feel sickly. He and Tony went to the doctor and got the news no couple wanted to hear. Dominic had stage four lung cancer. He underwent several aggressive rounds of chemo and radiation, which only caused him to become even sicker. His whole life, he was filled with enough energy to run schools, work two jobs, raise five children, and open his own business. In a matter of six months, he had lost his energy, but not his resilience. The family made the most of the time they had left with my grandpa, and he trooped along with them on family trips to Kachera, and on the holidays, he soaked in every moment with his children and grandchildren. Dominic Malika was moved into hospice care at the end of January 1998 and passed away shortly after on February 2nd. While the family grieved the loss of a man who raised them, the community mourned the remarkable man who shaped the lives of hundreds of children and families. In his book, Amusings of a Middle School Man, Ross McGaskill included the message that he said over the intercom the day Dominic passed. McGaskill writes, some teachers in your classrooms may never have met Mr. Malika because they are new to our school in the past five years. But some of your teachers called him their boss. He hired many of us, he believed in all of us, and we called him our friend. I am only telling you this because good and great people do things that go beyond only those who knew him. Mr. Malika built Eagle View. He designed the classrooms, the gym, and the library media center. He bought the furniture and created the dream, which has become this place we call our school. I believe this quote captures the depth of Dominic's legacy and the man that my grandfather was. I unfortunately did not get the chance to know my grandfather, but I was able to attend Eagle View Middle School, a place that has shaped who I am today. I speak from experience when I say that even 30 years later, the design, scheduling, and tradition of exceptional teachers continues. I still carry the life lessons that I learned at Eagle View and have been able to appreciate them even more as I attain higher education. For those of you here who did not know my grandfather, there is a chance that his legacy has touched you. Maybe you know someone who had Mr. Malika as a principal and carries one of his priceless life lessons with them. Maybe your child has attended middle school in District 20 and has thrived at a crucial time in their life. Or maybe on a rough day, you stopped into Malika's Deli and treated yourself to a cannoli that put a smile on your face. In his eulogy for my grandfather, McGaskill said, we remember a man with whom we all felt safe. And if we can no longer feel those arms of safety, just as surely that feeling is there in the form of lessons taught, values molded, in the wisdom of his words. My grandfather's capacity for making people feel known, loved, and safe is the most crucial element of his legacy in Colorado Springs. Now, I would like to share with you all some of the awards that were given to Dominic throughout his life. My grandpa had always cared more about the quality of his students' learning than the accolades he received. But I, as his granddaughter, I am immensely proud to share these awards with you. But for time's sake, I will list the three that meant the most to him and our family. Outstanding Administrator of the Year Award was given to Dominic in 1987 because he established the first library with computer access for his students in District 20. Ross McGaskill states that Dominic knew that a school could only be great if it had a great library. Dominic understood the importance of providing his students with the resources necessary to succeed. Remember in 1987, personal computers were new and access was minimal. So providing his students with everyday access to computers was an incredible feat. The Academy District 20 Hall of Excellence Award was established in 2017 to, according to Academy District 20, honor those whose extraordinary contributions uphold the district's mission and tradition of excellence. Dominic and Malika was the inaugural member inducted into the Hall of Excellence 19 years after his death. The recognition that meant the most to Dominic Malika himself was the renaming of the Library Media Center at Eagle View Middle School to the Dominic Malika Library Media Center. 
Ross McGaskill was responsible for changing the name in 1994 after my grandpa retired. This acknowledgement meant the most to Dominic because it solidified his legacy to the school. His picture hangs on the wall in the library so that even students and teachers who never knew him could see the many ways that he contributed to the life of the school. I will leave you all with this final thought. Dominic Malika's strength, energy, work ethic, and love continue to affect the Colorado Springs community today. He made Colorado Springs better, but in return, it made him a better man. Thank you.